Hi, I'm Ashojib. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you, thank you. You're joining the dinner, I think. Okay, yeah. Okay. Today, the yeah, lunch, yeah. Uh, just very uh, nothing too serious. But uh, how the program is like, what their day-to-day uh, -day life is like, a little bit, yeah. Did yeah. you usually wait a couple of minutes after two thirty, or um, do you start right away? Yeah, maybe one or two minutes. I mean, there is still one minute. Yeah. Sounds good. <coughs> yeah, so, you know, again, this is a slightly, uh, well, this is it's, uh, not a normal day for colloquium, so mm -hmm. some people have uh, commitment. Yeah. You're coming to dinner, right? I am. Yes. Great. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so six at eight. Great. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're very fortunate today to have Anwar Shojib. Uh, Anwar uh, got his PhD at UCLA in 2020, working with uh, Tommaso Treu. Uh, he then moved to the University of Chicago, uh, first as a fellow at the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics, um, but then he uh, won a NASA Hubble Einstein Fellowship and has been a, an Einstein Fellow at Chicago uh, ever since. Um, Anwar is an observational cosmologist who combines ver two very fundamental aspects of, uh, of observational cosmology. He studies uh, strong lensing, uh, which is one of the most powerful techniques for uh, figuring out how the Hubble constant uh, evolved over time, and also uh, is able to use these measurements uh, to get a handle 
on galaxy evolution and particularly the uh, role of feedback. Uh, today, he's going to tell us about the strong lensing revolution in the JWST Rubin Roman era from resolving the Hubble tension to constraining baryonic feedback. Uh, Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction, uh, and I'm very glad to be here uh, telling you about what I do um, in my research, uh, and thanks a lot to Nigel. You already described uh, or did a job for my first two slides with the very nice introduction. So yeah, um, so I'm an ob observational cosmologist and extragalactic astronomer. Uh, my observational tool of choice is strong lensing, and today I'm going to tell you about two uh, components of my research program, first in cosmology, where I'm going to describe how we can measure the Hubble constant from strong lensing time delays, and then also how we can constrain dark energy equation of state parameters from strong lensing time delays and also another type of strong lenses called compound lensing. Uh, then I'm going to talk about galaxy evolution side of my research program where I'm going to describe uh, a bit about uh, how we can constrain baryonic feedback processes and, uh, and galaxy mass profile. Uh, so first, cosmology. So in my opinion, the field of modern observational cosmology started a little over 100 years ago when um, Sir uh, Edwin Hubble discovered the universe is expanding. So what it means if we trace back in time at the very uh, beginning of the universe, everything in the universe wa uh, was confined within a very tiny space, and then it, uh, the universe is, uh, ex started to expand very rapidly, the event we call Big Bang, and the universe has been expanding ever since. Uh, so the expansion rate at any given time is called the Hubble parameter, and the expansion rate at the current time is called the Hubble constant. So it's not a constant in time, but it's a constant in space, uh, nonetheless, this is a fundamental constant of nature, so this Hubble constant is one of the central cosmological parameters that we measure. Um, central because it directly tells us the age of the universe, so that's one of the fundamental questions we can ask about our universe. And it also sets the, all the distances to all faraway galaxies, so this is all the, the knowing the value of the Hubble constant has uh, important implications from, for um, most astrophysics that we do. Now, uh, through various breakthroughs, both in observation and, and theory, we have a standard model for cosmology, which we call the lambda CDM model. So here is a pie chart showing you the, the different components in this lambda CDM model. So 68% of all the energy uh, in, this, uh, in the universe is in the form of this uh, thing called dark energy, which is, uh, is um, uh, which, uh, which is analogous to the cosmological constant lambda in Einstein field equation, so that's the lambda in the lambda CDM model. And then 27% of the universe's uh, matter energy budget is in the form of cold dark matter, so that's the CDM part, and the rest is 5% uh, is visible matter. Now this lambda CDM model has been remarkably successful in explaining a lot of observations uh, at various scales, so I'll show you one such example of uh, its success, which is uh, this map of temperature fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background uh, observed by the Planck satellite. So here's a small cartoon of Planck. Um, now, if we look at the fluctuation pattern in this map and take an angular pi spectra, which is analogous to taking a Fourier uh, analysis or decomposition of, of, the, uh, of the fluctuation, uh, we have, uh, these red data points that are coming from this map. And the blue line is the best fit model using lambda CDM. So you can see how well this lambda CDM model with only six free parameters is, uh, is capable to fit all the features that you see to very uh, uh, high precision um, uh, in, in this data. So this is one of the remarkable successes of the lambda CDM cosmology. Now, um, one outcome of the CMB measurement is the Hubble constant uh, uh, prediction that we can get from here. So what the CMB measurement gives you, especially the, the position of this first peak, is the Hubble parameter at the last scattering surface, or the epoch of recombination, only 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And using the lambda CDM model, which sets the expansion history of the universe, 
that then tells us or gives a prediction for the Hubble constant, uh, which is the expansion rate at the current time. So here in this plot, I'm showing you the uh, CMB plus lambda CDM prediction for the Hubble constant. X axis is showing you a timeline, and Y axis is showing you the Hubble constant uh, with its usual unit here. So you can see um, that the prediction, uh, because it's based on the measurement done by uh, first the WMAP satellite and then the Planck, became more and more precise over time. Now here we have a prediction from the lambda CDM model. So as a physicist, we can go and directly measure the Hubble constant as another test for this lambda CDM model. So how do you do that? So one conventional way to directly measure the Hubble constant is, uh, is called this cosmic distance ladder of type 1 supernova. So uh, here uh, is an illustration of how it works. So basically, we want to measure a distance to faraway galaxies. And cosmological distance has uh, inverse propor proportionality dependence on the Hubble constant. So if we can measure a cosmological distance, uh, distance that directly gives us a measurement of the Hubble constant. So in this method, we have different steps. Uh, so that's why it's called a distance ladder. So in the first step, we measure distances to a uh, type of star called Cephalids in our own Milky Way galaxies. And that helps us to calibrate the uh, absolute brightness, or uh, actually the period luminosity relation um, for this kind of stars. So we can now use these calibrated stars uh, and go uh, to nearby galaxies that are also hosts of type 1 supernova. So these calibrated cephalid stars uh, helps us to measure distances um, by using them as standard candles to these nearby galaxies. But now they're also host of type 1 and supernova. These tiny little explosions are depicting those in this cartoon. Um, so that then gives us a calibration for the absolute brightness of the type 1 and supernova. And at that point, the type 1 and supernova becomes standard candles. So now we can go to very far away galaxies that are in the Hubble flow, um, and then e using the type 1 and supernova as the standardized candles, we can measure distances to them. So now using this method, uh, what do you find? So the, the gray points are showing you the directly measured values of Hubble constant. So you can see shortly after the year 2000, there was a very good agreement between the prediction from CMB plus lambda CDM and the directly measured value of the Hubble constant from this kind of distance ladder. Uh, so this is the measurement from the Hubble Key Project, one of the main goal of the Hubble Space Telescope. But as these kind of measurements became uh, precise over time, a tension or disagreement between these two values emerged. So if I draw some lines to guide your eyes, uh, this tension has become more than five sigma uh, in statistical significance. So it's a very strong uh, disagreement right now. So what can be the source of this big disagreement? So one can be that it's systematics in either or both of these measurements. But if you can rule out uh, systematics as the source of this disagreement, then it has to be some new physics beyond our standard model of the lambda CDM cosmology. So there is a big opportunity to discover some new physics here if we can rule out systematics from these measurements. So there are many theories that have been uh, proposed, uh, theoretical extension to lambda CDM cosmology. So the uh, one that works the best so far is, an, uh, is a form of early dark energy. So a dark energy-like component that was dominant in the very early universe before the epoch of recombination. So to rule out systematics um, in, in these kind of measurements and to confirm that there, this disagreement is real and there is some new physics, what we need is a third independent measurement of the Hubble constant that is precise to about 1% and also accurate. So that's where I'm going. That's my goal of measuring Hubble constant to 1% precision and accuracy. And I have set it here uh, in about nine years to reach there. So another nice thing about having this independent 1% uh, measurement of the Hubble constant is that uh, having a 1% prior on the Hubble constant is a requirement for stage 4 dark energy experiments like Rubin uh, LSST and the square kilometer array. So this plot is showing you if we have a 2% percent uh, h naught prior, then there will be a 16% improvement in the joint constraint of the two dark energy equation state parameters. 
Uh, with one person, however constant prior, the improvement would be 45%. Uh, so this is my goal of one percent uh, Hubble constant measurement with strong lensing time delays, which is my observational uh, probe. Uh, but before uh, uh, I, I t uh, tell you how I, uh, we can reach there, first I'm going to tell you about this measurement, which was done in the 2018, uh, that gave us a two percent measurement of the Hubble constant from this probe. And then um, we redesigned our experiment and accounted for a previously unaccounted source of systematics. So that led to uh, a, an increase in the total error bar. So that's the 8% current uh, measurement of the Hubble constant from my, from my uh, probe. But from here on, uh, I'm going to tell you how I can reach a 2% intermediate goal in about three to four years. And then ultimately, uh, after that, I'm going to uh, get to 1% goal. So before I tell you how strong lensing uh, measures the Hubble constant, first let me tell you the advantages of this probe. So first, this is a one-step measurement of the Hubble constant, so uh, it doesn't have multiple steps uh, uh, similar to the distance ladder. So there is no risk of hidden systematics uh, in uh, different steps of the ladder. Uh, this physics is very well understood for strong lensing, is, a f is, is general relativity, that's, that's its play, and it is a very well understood theory and well tested theory. And strong lensing is not affected by dust. So the distances that we measure uh, are angular diameter distances, so it does, it's, um, it's not vulnerable uh, like luminosity distances can be to dust. So now, uh, a brief introduction uh, of how strong lensing works. So here is an example of strong lensing happening on Earth. So you can see uh, when the fish uh, swims near the corner of the aquarium, lights get deflected in such a way, you see two images of the same background fish. So the same thing happens in space. Uh, when we have a background quasar very far away from us, and there is an intervening galaxy, light gets deflected by the, the um, gravitational um, impact of the mass in, the, in these intervening galaxies, and then we see multiple images of this background quasar appearing. So here, this is a real image taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, now here is another uh, real image of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, taken using Hubble Space Telescope for such a system. Now, when two photons that are emitted at the same time from the background quasar, when they arrive at us, they arrive with a time delay. And the reason for that, first, because uh, they have traveled different cosmo cosmological distances uh, due to some asymmetry of the whole system. Um, and there is another contribution to this time delay, which is be, uh, because the two photons have gone through different depths of the potential well created by the foreground galaxy. So this is the so-called Shapiro delay that's added to the uh, uh, total time delay. Now, we can measure this time delay when this background source uh, is, is time variable. So quasars are intrinsically variable. So what we do, we uh, monitor the light curves uh, or the brightnesses of these quasars to get the light curve, uh, as shown here in this plot. And this is usually done with one or two meter class telescopes. So here you can see the, li uh, uh, the light curve has been taken over uh, eight to nine months. And so this is the light curve of image B here, and the red uh, one is from image A. And there, um, th this is showing you the similar feature, the same peak appearing in the light curves of these two images with a, with a delay. So that is the measurement of the time delay between these two images. <coughs> now once we have measured this time delay uh, between these two images, this time delay depends on uh, a combination of three angular diameter distances that is involved in the lensing system. So the distance between the observer and the lens galaxy, uh, the distance between the lens galaxy and the, s and the source, and also the total distance between the observer and the source. Now this particular combination is inversely proportional to one over uh, Hubble constant. So that's why uh, this time delay measurement carries cosmological information uh, in, in, in the form of this distance ratio. But to get to this measurement of the Hubble constant, first we need to factor out these terms. So one is a geometric term that gives rise right to the path difference, 
Uh, this is the easier part because uh, this depends on where the image appears and we only see it in the imaging that we have. The hard part is this one, uh, which, which is coming from the gravitational potential difference between the image positions giving rise to the shaft period delay. So we have to estimate this uh, gravitational potential difference. Uh, so this depends on two things. The dominant so, uh, source of this gravitational potential uh, is coming from the central deflector or the central lensing galaxy here. Uh, but there are also line of sight structures. So for example, galaxies that are close by Individually, they have a small uh, amount of perturbation added to the overall lensing effect. And in total, uh, all of the nearby line of sight galaxies can perturb uh, the overall effect to a few percent. And since we are trying to do precision cosmology here, we need to account for this uh, small perturbation at the level of a few percent. So we do this using um, uh, uh, spectroscopic and photometric data of the whole field. Um, so this is an independent measurement of this additional perturbation. I'm not going to uh, tell anything further on this uh, line of sight effect. Uh, what I'm going to expand more on uh, is, the, is the contribution from the central deflector, which is the dominant contribution in this potential term. So to estimate this potential term or the difference between the gravitational potential between the positions of these two images, what it do is model the mass distribution in this central lensing galaxy. So here, uh, the simplest model we can take is, uh, is an elliptical mass distribution because you already see this galaxy is an elliptical galaxy. And most lensing galaxies are found to be elliptical just because they are more massive, so they have more lensing power. Uh, now radially, we take a power law form. So uh, it has a dep the density profile has a dependence on radius like this. Now you, can, you may ask why a power law profile? Uh, if we think about the mass distribution in galaxies, we know that there is stars and then dark matter. So you already see the star distribution, uh, when you look at the light distribution, doesn't follow a simple power law. And also the dark matter uh, is, it follows uh, something like a navarro frank uh, white profile or the NFW profile, which is not also a power law. But it has been observed that if we take the total mass distribution uh, as a power law, it can describe uh, very well different types of data. So it can describe stellar velocity dispersion or stellar kinematics, which is another probe of the mass distribution in galaxies. Uh, the extra temperature profile of hot gas in, in, the, in the halo that is in the hydrostatic equilibrium those kind of data can also be fit very well with a power law mass profile to the noise level. And also in hydrodynamical simulation of galaxy formation, the overall mass profile uh, seems to be very close to a power law form. Now, if we use this simple power law mass profile to model the mass distribution in lensing galaxies, we can also do very well in fitting the data that we have. So here is an, uh, a, a lensing system that is very complicated. Uh, we have a quasar at the very back, which is being lensed into these four uh, point images. We have an intervening second source galaxy that is being uh, lensed into these additional arcs or two uh, images appearing from this uh, intervening source, uh, second source galaxy. Now, the second source galaxy also ha has some lensing effect on the background quasar. So in the model of this system, uh, both the uh, mass distribution of the central galaxy and the second source galaxy have been accounted for. Uh, in addition to that, there is a small satellite galaxy here, for, uh, which is a satellite galaxy of this larger central galaxy. Uh, and this is even giving rise to a fifth uh, faint uh, image here. So all of these different mass models have been modeled in this system with, a pow with power law mass profile. And this is data from HST. So this is a color composite from three different filters uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the model uh, using this mass profile, uh, power law mass profile. And you can see how closely we can reproduce the observed image from Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and so this is the residual uh, normalized by the noise level. So just to pro uh, prove to you that the modeling has been done up to the noise level. So using this power law model for this system and the measured time delay, um, uh, 
I measured the Hubble constant just from one uh, from this one system to four person precision, so which is this data point here. So, and I'm part of uh, a collaboration called TD Cosmo Collaboration. So it used to be called Holy Cow. We have uh, rebranded into TD Cosmo. Um, so in this collaboration, we have applied this method to a total of seven lens quasars. So here are all those seven systems. And combining all these seven individual measurements of the Hubble constant, we got to this two-person measurement uh, of the Hubble constant. Um, so now all, both of these measurements uh, are dependent on the power law mass model assumption. So here, uh, I'm, there is a legend uh, for these different type of uh, measurements all coming from lensing with various observation or data products. Now at this point, we have a two-person measurement of the Hubble constant that is in very good agreement with the Safford-based uh, uh, measurement of the Hubble constant. So these confirms that the Hubble uh, tension is real and then there is some new physics uh, beyond the lambda and cosmology. Well, not so fast. Why? Because we have to remember this code from Yogi Berra, which says, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. And for an observer like me, the difference between theory and practice is systematics. So what is the main systematics in this uh, measurement of the Hubble constant? So here is a very uh, uh, brief and qualitative explanation for uh, the major systematic uh, for a strong lensing measurement of the Hubble constant. So this comes from this transformation called mass sheet transformation. So uh, if we start with the power law mass profile, so in a log log plot of density versus radius, this looks like a straight line. And as I said, this type of mass profile uh, fits the imaging data very well. Now we can apply a transformation on this mass profile where we uh, rescale the overall amplitude of the mass profile and add a constant sheet, uh, an infinite sheet of mass. Uh, after this transformation, the mass profile may look like this. And the mathematical nature of this transformation is such that this transformed mass profile will also fit the imaging data equally well. So uh, due to mass sheet transformation, we cannot differentiate, or the imaging data cannot differentiate between this profile and that profile. However, uh, after the transformation, this is not a power law anymore. Now, this new mass profile uh, has a different shape in the mass distribution, so it will have a different prediction for the overall uh, potential and the potential difference. So the Hubble constant that we infer from uh, this other type of mass profile uh, will be different. But since if uh, we have taken our mass model to only be a power law, this uh, power law mass model assumption is not allowing this other type of mass profile that can also be fit to the imaging data, but would lead to a different value of the Hubble constant. Uh, so lensing data itself cannot distinguish the, uh, these two mass profiles, but we are implicitly breaking this degeneracy uh, by our model assumption. Now, if the true mass profile I is not a power law in galaxies, then, then it would lead to a bias in the Hubble constant that we measure. So due to this, uh, we have redesigned our experiment to allow flexibility beyond the power law mass model so that these kind of mass profiles are also allowed in our analysis. Uh, but then that this leads to a lot of freedom, so the uncertainty will be too large, and we want to break this degeneracy, the mass sheet degeneracy, in lensing, and the way to do that is to use non-lensing data that doesn't have the same degeneracy. So one type of non-lensing data uh, that also probe the mass distribution in, in, in the galaxies is stellar velocity dispersion or stellar kinematics. So that's what I did. We used a more flexible mass model in our modeling and then use stellar kinematics to then constrain the, the additional flexibility that has been allowed in the mass model. So after doing that, then we arrive at this eight person measurement uh, from flexible mass model and stellar velocity dispersion. So from now, um, my goal is to get to one person. So how do you get there? So there are two ways we can improve the precision from now on. So one is to use specially resolved velocity dispersion um, so we have already used an integrated or unresolved velocity dispersion uh, for the seven lensing galaxies that we have done this analysis for. 
but especially resolved dual state dispersion provides more information uh, on the overall mass distribution in the lensing galaxy. And it also breaks another uh, degeneracy that is in the uh, stellar kinematics data, which is the mass annotatable degeneracy. So especially resolved dual state dispersion is more powerful in breaking that degeneracy in the in stellar kinematics data itself. And in combination, strong uh, lensing and especially resolved dual, uh, dual state dispersion, it helps to simultaneously break both mass degeneracy and mass anastable degeneracy. So this is a lot more powerful in constraining the Hubble constant. I'm going to show you an example very soon. Uh, the other way is to apply a strong prior on the mass profile shape, uh, but then from a larger sample of external galaxies. Uh, just because the sample of the lens galaxies that we directly measure Hubble constant from is small, so uh, we, we go to an external sample of galaxies to get a strong prior on, on the shape of the mass profile. So here is an example of how strong uh, the constraining power of special resolve stellar kinematics is. So this is a uh, Hubble Space Telescope image of uh, a lens quasar system. So when we take, uh, uh, when we have an unresolved velocity dispersion, that means we have taken one single spectra of the whole galaxy using a slit that is put on top of the galaxy uh, like this. But instead, you can uh, get uh, integral field in spectroscopy of the system. And what that uh, is, is uh, for each of these pixels, we have a spectra. Uh, so this is data taken from CAC telescope uh, with the KCWI instrument. And you can see this is the same system. So these three uh, quasar images are appearing here. The central galaxy is here. The other quasar image is here. Uh, so example of uh, spectra for uh, uh, two different pixels are being shown here. So when you go to a pixel near a quasar, you can see a broad emission line from the quasar appears. Uh, but at, at the center of the galaxy, uh, uh, the contribution from this quasar is small. What we are looking at are these two absorption features in the spectra. So these are calcium H and K lines. And the width of these two lines tells us the stellar velocity dispersion. Now, um, I extracted the stellar velocity dispersion in 40 different uh, beans within this yellow region. So this just, have, uh, this just happens to look like Pac-Man. It was not done on purpose. Uh, but within this region, so here is the map of special results stellar velocity dispersion. Now, using this measurement, just for one system, I measured Hubble constant to 9% precision. But if we compare that with this previous measurement that was at 8% from seven systems, but only with unresolved kinematics, you can see these two data points are comparable. So this gives you the idea that especially the stellar kinematics can be about seven times powerful in constraining the Hubble constant. And it can be even more if we have uh, data of higher quality. So where can we get data of high quality? The obvious answer is JWST. So we have three approved programs uh, currently from JWST. Um, so I am co-I of the cycle one program and co-PI of the cycle two program. And we are also getting data from this GTO program that are looking at uh, three of the already analyzed systems out of the seven lens quasar. So you already have data coming in. Some of them are already in hand and some will be coming in very soon for the seven systems that have been analyzed so far already for all the other pieces of data set. But the missing piece right now is this JWST uh, near spec spectra to give us special results stellar velocity dispersion measurement. So just to give you an example of uh, the data in hand, so this is HST imaging of the same system that uh, I was showing in the previous slide. And this is uh, the white light image from the JWST near spec data cube. So you can see the exquisite uh, resolution uh, uh, in the JWC data. It, uh, it almost like this is IFE spectra, but it, uh, it's already good enough uh, um, or as very similar in quality with, with the HST data that we can do lens modeling with it if we wanted to. So this data set from JWST is forecasted to give us 2% measurement in the Hubble constant. So that takes me to my intermediate goal of measuring Hubble constant to 2%. And uh, so we are going to get there in about three to four years uh, after we, we uh, 
uh, analyze this data set. Actually, I am actively working on this data set uh, right now with cycle one data. And then uh, I'll also work on it when cycle two data starts coming in. Um, so in the future, there are other uh, ways that we can measure Hubble constant using strongly dense time delays, and that would be using strongly dense supernova. So that would open up another type of lenses that we can measure Hubble constant from. Because supernova, just like quasars, are also time variable sources, so we can measure time delays. But one nice thing about supernova is that we can measure the magnification, uh, the lensing magnification of lens supernova. And that also breaks the Marshall degeneracy uh, without needing the velocity dispersion measurement. So here's a, uh, an illustration of how that would work. So if we have a sample of non-lens supernova, and we have one lens supernova, that then we can measure the magnification of, of the lens supernova. So here is a forecast of the precision that we'll get using this new probe of uh, cosmology. So this is showing you the number of lens supernova. Uh, so after about 10 years of Rubin, uh, we'll, uh, Rubin will give us about 150 lens super, uh, type 1 supernova. And that would take us to 1% precision of Hubble constant just using this sample uh, without needing any species of velocity dispersion for these lensing systems. Uh, and this forecast scenario was done for uh, Rubin lens supernova plus the unlensed uh, sample of supernova are coming from Roman. So uh, my total ro roadmap to 1% Hubble constant, there are two routes that we can get to 1%. The first is having a sample of 40 time delay lens quasars with IFA spectra to give us a special result velocity dispersion. Or uh, we can also reach there with about 150 lens type 1 supernova. And uh, both are achievable, achievable uh, with the help of JWST, Rubin, and Roman uh, in about nine years. So now a little bit about dark energy. So when we are measuring Hubble constant to about 1% precision, this strong lensing time delay will also provide competitive constraints on dark energy equation of state parameter. But there will be one more exciting probe of dark energy, uh, which is uh, this kind of double source systems, uh, where we have two sources being lensed by the same uh, lens galaxy. And for this kind of system, we can measure uh, the, the ratio of these four distances. Now, this is a ratio of four uh, or an even number of cosmological distances. So there is no dependence on Hubble constant. But this is still dependent on other cosmological parameters, like the density parameters and the two equation state parameters, uh, W0 and WA for dark energy. So these kind of systems have been rare so far. Only four are known. Uh, so currently, uh, two students are working with me to uh, constrain dark energy parameters uh, for two of these systems out of the four known. Uh, so Pierre Bocard, who is a master's student from EPFL, and Hannah Escobe, uh, who used to be uh, an undergrad at Chicago when she started to work with me. And now she is a PhD student at uh, CMU. So here is the forecast for the combined constraint on dark energy equation and state parameters from strong lensing. Um, so we can see uh, the yellow contour is for a strong lensing after 10 years of Rubin survey. Uh, now this is a conservative estimate uh, because this only uh, includes the time delay lens quasars and co uh, this kind of double source plane lensing. It doesn't include the lens supernova. So if you also include uh, the lens supernova in this forecast, this will be at least as strong as the clustering, which is uh, this cyan one. I'm sorry if it's a little hard to see the colors from where you are. So the other way to get to a uh, improved constraint on the Hubble constant is to have a mass profile prior from a large sample of external galaxies. But before I tell you that, let me get, get to the second section of my talk, which is on galaxy evolution. So here, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about these kind of galaxies. Uh, zoom in. So these kind of galaxies, the background, uh, or this kind of lensing system, the background galaxies do not have a quasar. So you only see lensed arcs uh, from the background uh, galaxy that is extended. Uh, or sometimes we can see full Einstein ring, like this one here. So as opposed to uh, this kind of lenses, where we have a point source that is time variable, uh, like lens quasar. So this kind of time variable point sources 
gives us a way to measure the time delay. But for, for this kind of galaxy-galaxy lens systems, we cannot measure time delay. However, we can still use their lensing information and their stellar velocity dispersion to, to constrain the mass distribution in these galaxies. And what we can do uh, is individually constrain the dark matter distribution and, uh, and the stellar mass distribution. So for this single galaxy, the dark matter distribution is being shown in this dark shaded region. And um, the stellar mass distribution is being shown in this uh, blue shaded region. So the total matter um, is being shown in the purple color. So when we have this kind of uh, individually constrained mass distribution in these galaxies, there are two things we can measure. Uh, one is what is the average slope of this mass distribution? And the other way, uh, other thing that we can uh, constrain is the fraction of dark matter within some radius. So we take uh, the half mass uh, or half light radius um, as, as a scale for this galaxy and then constrain what is the fraction of dark matter within this half light radius. So now if we plot these two, uh, uh, the data points for these two quantities, so x axis is the dark matter fraction, and y axis is showing you the average logarithmic slope. So this is the distribution of the points for the sample of galaxies I've shown you in the slide, a previous slide. We can contrast this distribution with simulation, and that tells us something about uh, the baryonic feedback processes and also the stellar initial mass function. The first of all, the first thing you notice is that there is an offset between these two lines, uh, which are the prediction of simulation and, and the data points. And that's because in simulation, uh, people have chosen the uh, Chebrier initial mass function, which is a lighter initial mass function. So if we use a heavier initial mass function, like Saltpeter, that will increase the stellar mass, the total stellar mass in these galaxies. So this will decrease the dark matter fraction. So that would move these lines uh, towards left. So this tells you that the uh, initial mass function in this massive object galaxies is heavy, like a saltpeter. So one, this, this is one of the observational outcome um, for uh, studying galaxy evolution using strong lensing. The second thing we can look at is the slope of this mass distribution. And that's because there's a difference between these two lines. And the difference is coming from what kind of uh, feedback processes have been accounted for in these two simulations. So if there is agent feedback, with the, which is this line, the slope is shallower uh, without the case, uh, without agent feedback, which is this other line. So if we have a lot of measurements of, uh, uh, like this, then we can precisely constrain the, uh, the slope of this, uh, of this distribution and then the simulation can be tuned so that we can find out what is the relative importance or imp uh, contribution of these three different types of feedback processes to reproduce the observ observation. And that would tell us the, uh, the, the exact mixture of AGN and stellar feedback that have been at play uh, along the evolutionary process of these galaxies. Now, I also have measured the mass distribution individually in dark matter and baryons in this sample of galaxy-galaxy lenses. So that also gives me a way to find out how much deviation there is in the mass distribution from a simple case of power law. So th this plot is showing you that. Um, so the deviation from power law in percentages. And this purple shaded line is the mean deviation for the, the sample of 23 lensing galaxies. So you can see uh, within this gray shaded region, which is the radius where the images or the lensed arcs appear. So this is the so-called Einstein radius. And the, uh, for time delay measurement of strong lensing, it's the most important to get the mass profile slope right at this radius. So at this radius, the, uh, the mean mass profile is about 5% uh, offset from the power law mass model. But uh, this is still within one sigma. So we cannot differentiate a power law versus a non-power law model with high stellar significance yet. But we can still use uh, this mass profile uh, from the sample of 23 lensing systems as a prior for uh, to improve the Hubble constant precision. So after having done that, this is the measurement that we arrive at. 
So first of all, uh, without the prior, we had 8% measurement. With the prior, we have 5% measurement. So the prior is doing its job in improving the precision. But surprisingly, it also moves the mean uh, very coincidentally right on top of the CMB plus lambda CDM prediction that was not done on purpose. Uh, so all, all the measurements we do are done blindly. So what that means, during the measurement or the analysis, we do not look at what the Hubble constant we're going to get. And after um, all the systematic checks have been uh, carried out, all the co-authors agree that there is nothing to be checked anymore, then we freeze our analysis, and the agreement is that after unblinding, whatever Hubble constant we find, we're going to uh, publish it without any more alteration. So, uh, so these values are all blinded measurements. So yeah, we are also surprised to see this very coincidental uh, um, superposition of this measurement with the CMB uh, measurement of the Hubble constant. However, all of these measurements are within one sigma uh, with, within each other. So there is no uh, strong sign of internal inconsistency yet. So this can be just a statistical fluke. Another reason is, uh, another caveat uh, here can be the uh, whether with the, pr uh, the, the prior we are using is justified or not. So the sample of galaxies that I'm getting this prior from, their mean redshift is 0.2. But the mean redshift of the time delay lens uh, quasars, so the galaxies in those systems, is 0.6. So the implicit assumption being made when we're using this prior is that there is no evolution in the overall mass profile between these two, red two redshifts, which is about 4 billion years. So that's the caveat, that we are assuming no evolution. Um, but to, to resolve this caveat, what we need is a sample of external galaxies or external land, uh, uh, land systems with, with galaxies at ratio of 0.6. So to do that, uh, so I designed uh, Project Dinos, uh, which is an HST archival program. So now the goal of this program is to model more systems, uh, more lensing systems, that are galaxy-galaxy lens systems, and a large fraction of them would be at this high ratio of 0.6. And then it will tell us if there is an evolution between the ratio of 0.2 or 0.6. So the modeling has been done by my graduate student mentee, Chin Itan, at U Chicago. Uh, so this is the uh, main result we, we got that uh, so the power law mass model is being shown in, uh, with this dashed line, and the average mass profile from this large sample of 77 system um, still only deviates by about 10%, uh, but that deviation is within one sigma from the power law. Um, so we still cannot distinguish between a power law and non-power law model in these galaxies with high statistical, statistical significance, the main reason is these high redshift sample, the archival data is, uh, is shallow, so they, these are a snapshot program, so the exposure time are not long. So you can already see that they are quite a bit noisier than these ones. So to, to solve this problem, we actually proposed for a new program, uh, uh, new HST program that we got data for, and currently we are analyzing that data to get uh, tighter constraint or handle on, on if there is an evolution in the mass profile between two redshifts. So uh, this result has been uh, presented already in, in a series of, pa uh, in the first paper of the Project Dino series, uh, and the analysis of the new data from the new HST program will be presented in the Dinos 2. So, What's for, uh, in the future for Project Dinos or just uh, the field of galaxy evolution uh, using strong lensing? So before talking about the future, let me take a step back and go uh, about 10 years before when SDSS was the survey that was providing the largest sample of galaxy-galaxy lenses. And from this survey, we discovered about 100 galaxy-galaxy uh, lens systems. So here is a small circle, uh, its area, uh, represents this number 100, the sample size. The next big survey that gave us a lot of new lending system is Dark Energy Survey, and it gave us a sample of about 500 new lending systems. So I'm co-PI of a new multi-year HST program. We have 500 orbits in this program. Um, so it just started, so over the course of the next few to four years, we are gonna get uh, um, 
a few hundreds of lenses being um, imaged in this program. So that would give us the largest sample of strong lending systems in the next three to four, four years. But then Rubin Observatory is going to have first light this year and arrival of uh, real data next year. That, that's the current timeline. After about 10 years of this survey, the Rubin Observatory is going to discover about 200,000 galaxy galaxy lens system. So you can see this very large circle, it's literally out of the chart. So when we have this very large sample of lenses, one uh, technical challenge would be to analyze all, these, all of these systems to get to our science. So conventionally, uh, as I've been to uh, talking about lens modeling, that is a very time consuming process. And we have to model one system at a time because all the lensing system, they look a little bit different from each other. So we have to fine tune the model that we, uh, we apply uh, or the model components that we, we take for each system. So that's a very time consuming process. And uh, my goal is to automate that process using artificial intelligence. So here's a way we can do that. Uh, we can make the decision making process that currently needs a human to look at a lensing system like this and ask questions like how many images there are. Uh, so there are four images of the background quasar and two images appearing for a second source galaxy. Uh, or yeah, if there are additional sources or if there is additional lensing objects. So all of these complexities that can be defined for each system will lead to a different decision making process necessary to have an optimal model for a system. But these are all visual recognition tasks that we can use uh, an AI uh, to do it for us. And so here is an illustration uh, of a machine learning or a neural network that does this visual recognition. So this is work done by Vedan Sahu, who was an undergraduate student at UCLA. Uh, so you can see, uh, given this input image of a lens quasar system with four quasars, the neural network is doing very well in tagging each pixel for what uh, that pixel, uh, what component in the lensing system that pixel belongs to. So the purple uh, pixels are background uh, pixels. The blue pixels belong to the central lensing galaxy. And the yellow pixel belongs to the lens quasar. So once this visual recognition is dusk, uh, done by a neural network, then this output of the neural network can be used uh, using a very um, straightforward algorithm to design a mask when we do the modeling and also set up all the uh, components in the lens mass model. So this is a way, this is a hybrid way to automate the, uh, the lens modeling process, uh, which uses machine learning for the decision making, but it still uses conventional lens modeling software to do the rest. So that was uh, all about my research program. So before I finish, I'm going to uh, briefly tell you about my outreach initiative, which I call the Astro Breach Program. Um, so so this is a bridge program uh, intended for undergraduate students to give them research opportunities. So they are from communities or countries that lack uh, access to research opportunities at the undergraduate level. So one example would be my own home country, Bangladesh. Uh, so currently I am mentoring uh, 20 undergraduate students, uh, all from different Bangladeshi universities. Uh, and they're all working on the same project with the goal to write one paper with all of them being co-authors. And uh, so I, develop the template to make uh, these one to 20 or one to many, many undergraduate students uh, mentoring uh, efficient. Uh, and one way to do that would be having some modular design in the, in the research project. So if, there, if the data set is, uh, has repetitive components in, in, in the analysis, uh, for example, if I take lens modeling, each student is modeling one lensing system. So there is no duplication of work but uh, the basics of lens modeling are same. So all the students are working collaboratively, but they are still working uh, on their own independent piece of data. Uh, um, and it, it also requires online mentoring because usually uh, students at the undergraduate level do not have access to research opportunities due to geographical barrier. So, uh, so that's why uh, nowadays online mentoring is not a problem uh, due to Zoom and other platforms. And the data it needs, it needs to be already be there. So it, it can be a data proprietary to the mentor, or it can be public data. So in this project, 
uh, these students are working with archival Hubble Space Telescope data. Uh, so, we, so this project has been running for almost one year. We are very close to the finish line. We, we have a, a almost complete draft of a paper. So we are planning to submit the paper in a couple of months. Uh, so if any of you have any idea that uh, satisfies this condition, uh, please, I'll be uh, very happy to talk to you and uh, have you uh, mentor a new project under this program. So that's all from me. Uh, this is my summary slide. So to summarize, uh, strong lensing time delays and compound lensings are in the probes of cosmological parameters. So currently, uh, seven analyzed time delay lensed quasar system uh, gives us a 8% uh, measurement of the Hubble constant. But my uh, goal is to first get to 2% measurement of the Hubble constant to settle the Hubble tension at four sigma confidence level. And we, um, I'm going to get there into three to four years using the JWC approved programs. Uh, uh, so after that, Ruby and Roman will discover more lens quasars and supernova to measure Hubble constant at 1%. And a sample of about 100 uh, uh, compound or double source line lenses will give us competitive constraints on dark energy parameters. Strong lensing and dynamics as a probe of galaxy evolution. So Project Dinos will provide the largest sample of lens model for the next four years to constrain bearing feedback and stellar initial mass function uh, below RHA1. And then Rubin will completely change the game. Uh, it will discover tens over five lensing system. Uh, and at that point, we'll, we'll be able to answer these questions with very high statistical precision. Thank you for listening. A few questions? Oh. Right. So, so I have already talked about automated modeling for uh, but that would not take us all the way to, to model all 200,000 lens systems. So uh, like the conventional modeling is still a uh, computationally intensive task. Um, with the automated modeling, we, uh, this is going to decrease the need for human hours, but the type of uh, sample size I'm thinking about in the order of 1,000. For the, this very large lens sample of 200,000, it would be the, the machine learning will be the way to go all, all, like, you know, all the way up to extracting uh, model parameters. Mm -hmm. So, so for lensing data only, we will not be able to. Oh, okay. So the the question is, uh, when we have this very large lens sample from Rubin, uh, will we be uh, able to constrain the mass profile with all the flexibility in the mass profile accounted for? Uh, so the so the if we only have lensing data, which is imaging data primarily, that because of mass sheet degeneracy, it has no way to uh, differentiate between uh, these different shapes of mass profile. So Rubin data, however large the sample the sample sizes, it would still be uh, vulnerable to these mass sheet degeneracies. But uh, we can get uh, stellar velocity dispersion for a large lens sample, uh, maybe not 200,000. But currently, there is an approved program that I am a co-I of uh, using four most telescope to get stellar velocity dispersion of about 5,000 uh, lensing systems from Rubin. So that would already take us to have a very tight precision on the overall shape of the mass profile. Right. So the question is, how can we, uh, when we measure time delays from looking at uh, light curves of two different quasar images, and we are matching different, um, we are, we are finding out the same feature, but with a time delay in different light curves. How, how, how can we be sure if we are finding the same feature? So the overall light curve is fitted at the same time, not just at two features. 
So it's not like we're just taking uh, two peaks, but the overall light curve is being uh, fitted for. So the example I showed for illustration purpose, I chose the, just the two peaks, but there are tiny peaks uh, all through the light curves. And because the precision we can get with the two meter class telescope, the photometric precision is at the millimeter level. At that point, this very tiny precision that, ca that can have variability within a few days, those also provide constraints towards this overall time delay measurement. Uh, and this whole measurement method has been uh, validated using a blind data challenge for the community. So we are very confident that we are robustly measuring the time delay. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, question is, is everything in the universe moving? The galaxy, the Lesbian galaxy is moving with respect to the quasar. We're moving around our galaxy. So what sort of time scale do you expect to Yeah. So the question is, um, since everything is moving, so uh, basically everything has transverse motion, so the relative position of the lensing galaxy and the background source will change. So what is the timeline where we can expect a measurable difference in the lensing configuration you see? Very interesting question. I was just talking with Jeremy earlier this day. Uh, so I do not have an answer uh, right now, like in terms of like, um, of course, there will be a difference, but in terms of observation uh, with the current or near future instrumentation, uh, how long do you have to wait before you can measure such a, such a uh, difference in the configuration? Um, I think it can be done with some order of magnitude calculation, but I don't have a, a number right now to give you. But maybe I, 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 uh, I told Jeremy that I'll send him some number. Uh, I'll include you in that email. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, Paul. Oh. I'm very curious about the transferable program and how it's going to visualize your selection to the program. Mm -hmm. What the plan is for the Yeah. Also, the transferable because you have these different regions and you can't do it, but you know, like a pipeline. How much of that is that visible? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, the question is um, so, how I selected the, the students for this program? Um, what is the plan for this program itself in terms of future expansion? And is there a pipeline for uh, the student participating in this program to apply to grad school? So uh, the way I selected the students, so they are all from Bangladesh. Uh, so I knew, I, I knew a few faculty members at different universities. So I reached out to them asking for students that are already involved in some sort of um, like maybe an astronomy club or physics club or something like that. So they are already very enthusiastic about astronomy and physics in general. Um, so, so that gave me about 30 to 40 students that I reached out directly with email. And I had a survey form. It was, there was no real selection done. Uh, anyone practically that uh, completed the survey. Uh, I only said no to two students because they didn't have a, the prerequisite knowledge in the, in the programming. So that was asked for the students to know already. Uh, but it didn't need any prior knowledge in astronomy. So that, like, you know. Many students are from engineering major, and they, they are doing astronomy for the first time in this project. And I basically taught them some concepts that would be necessary um, in, in this project. Uh, so this, this, the second question was, what is the future vision? So, so I would like to expand this program with more mentors and more projects uh, being uh, offered to other communities, uh, other groups of the students. There is already a second project going on right now in the field of condensed matter physics. It is also being offered to Bangladeshi students. Uh, so this is another faculty member who, uh, who at Calstead Fullerton. Uh, so she's a, a physicist from Bangladesh, so I knew her from that network. So I. Uh,